Everyone's favourite foul-mouthed stomach with legs finally made his way to the Game Boy in 1992. Originally a 1982 arcade classic, Qbert is amongst the most recognisable characters from the golden age of arcade games. You have an isometric play area filled with 3D blocks. Each block is at a different height to the one next to it, requiring Qbert to jump up or down to them. When he jumps on a block, it'll change colour. The aim of each stage is to turn all the blocks to a target colour. On the Game Boy you have white, grey and black. On some levels, each with four sub-levels, they only flip between white and grey, others all three. Sometimes the blocks will cycle through the colours each time they're landed on, at other times they only need to be activated once, after which they'll stay on that colour. A little animation at the start of each level will tell you what you're aiming for. You're obviously not alone on these stages, it'd be a very tedious exercise if that were the case, but there are randomly and constantly spawning enemies to avoid. A ripple effect will appear on a block for a few seconds to indicate where something is about to spawn so you can avoid them. Some will start at the top and bounce downwards only, whereas others can jump back up and will follow you. Particularly notable is the spring with eyes, this guy actually chases you all around. Usually falling off the edge of the play area is a life lost, but the spring will actually follow you off as well, hellbent as he is on catching you. You can manipulate this by luring him towards these hovering discs at various places around the edge. Cuba will ride these to a different part of the stage and safely jump off, but they then vanish. The spring will still bounce right off though. A somewhat mind-bending enemy comes in the form of this little imp guy who seems to operate on a different gravitational plane to everything else. Whereas you and the majority of enemies navigate the X-plane, this guy can somehow use the sides of the blocks as his platforms in a very Escher-esque manner. He'll still kill you if you make contact, but his movements and position can be pretty tricky to interpret. I die to him a lot. Other things that spawn are foodstuffs such as apples that give you a score bonus, and a little pellet that freezes and renders harmless every baddie on the stage for a little while. Oh yeah, there's also this jackass with sunglasses that takes great pleasure in running down the stage, turning a line of blocks into a different colour. This guy is the main reason Qbert has such a foul mouth, I reckon. Actually, he's not too annoying in this version, as you can knock him out by jumping on him. He doesn't hurt you, and only makes one row of blocks that's not hard to reconvert. After every four-stage level, you get to watch a rather charming scene from Qbert the Movie, which is a roughly 30-second animation of Qbert trying to relax underneath a palm tree, but getting hit by a coconut. He gets mad in the way he always does when put under stress, swearing and cursing in his way, and decides to enact vengeance upon this tree. He attempts several ways to chop it down, but ultimately fails. It's very cute, very funny, and quite a reward for completing each quadrilogy of stages. If you beat the game, you get an input code that allows you to watch the whole thing. In the arcades, you got a diagonally mounted joystick, which avoided the confusion that can befall players of isometric games. Here you have two choices, you can use the D-pad normally, which relies on you pressing diagonal directions at all times, it makes your thumb ache after a while, but is easy to visualise. Or, right can move Qbert down and right, up can move him up and right. I always fail horribly trying to use that method as there seems to be no congruence for it, sometimes the directions are rotated 45 degrees left, sometimes right. The sounds are quite famous from the arcade, the plummeting sound you get when you fall off the course, the garbled swearing when Qbert gets attacked, the bye bye that he whimpers at the game over screen, they're all here and are synthesised to perfection. The best examples so far of sound synthesis? Oh, for sure. Flippin' heck, we're not done. I approach Sengokuden 2 with gut-wrenching fear. The first game is way down the bottom of the quality list, ranking easily in the top 10 worst Game Boy games. It was part real-time strategy, part brawler, spectacularly failing to create anything that could be considered compelling in either genre. 
My heart sank when I saw that world overview screen. It looks alarmingly similar to the first Sengokuden game. In fact, it's almost entirely recycled from that game. However, the strategy part is now not in real time, instead favouring a turn-based approach that is immediately so much more navigable and fairer. You can see how many tiles each of your units can move, and with only a handful of options it's not hard to figure out what does what in the menus. The combat sequences have changed now too, where before they were a side-on, 200% speed, platform-based beat-em-up, now the fight scenes resemble closer the G-Arms Gundam game, where you're in a top-down arena based on the landscape you're in. If you met in a wooded area, the arena will have lots of trees as obstacles, that sort of thing. And sadly, the fights are about as fun as they were in that one. Each of your units has two different attacks, and they have charge gauges. B is usually a projectile shot that you can use to fire from a distance, and A is your shorter ranged melee attack, which looks like two robots waving hockey sticks at each other. I understand why the long range attack has limited use, but not the other one. Each fight stage is timed, and if you run out of all of your ammo before the timer is up, you basically have to run around the arena avoiding your enemy until the clock counts down. Not a great design choice. If there is no victor, both units simply return to where they were on the map before the fight. If one mech is destroyed, it's out of the game and the winner takes the tile. Again, the graphics are something of a credit even if a lot of them are recycled. It's easy to see what is what on the map, and you're not overwhelmed by the constant enemy movements like you were in the first game. You can, shock of shocks, implement strategy through unit placement, actually giving some credibility to Sengokuden 2 in the strategy genre. The battle scenes still leave a lot to be desired, with the controls being not at all conducive to a fun experience, but unbelievably with what is up to this point the fourth Gundam game on the system, we're actually starting to get somewhere. Who knows, SD Gundam Sengokuden 3, Chiju Sakyohen might prove to even be good. Weirder things have happened. Jantaku is a word I've never seen in relation to mahjong before, but apparently it translates as sparrow table. I cannot find the word in many other sources, and there's scant information about this cartridge itself anywhere, but from what I can surmise, the game itself looks very reminiscent of Ryichi Mahjong. We've seen something close to this game before on the Game Boy, with the launch title Yakuman. Here, you can play with the traditional Ryichi rule set of four players. The basic premise is that you are trying to win points from your opponents using the standard Mahjong tiles. Each player is dealt 13 tiles that are visible only to them. In the centre, there is a wall of other tiles, from which each player draws at the start of their turn. You then need to discard tiles with the aim of arranging your hand into certain winning configurations. It's a bit like Rummy if you've ever played that card game. You need to have a hand of 14 tiles, i.e. including the one you just drew, that is made up of four groups of three and one pair, or three groups of four and one pair. The groups of three or four can be all the same tile or sequences in the same suit, for example the three, four and five of circles. There are a few other rules regarding how you're supposed to call winning hands, but that brief overview should be enough to get you familiarised with how the game works. When choosing what kind of hand you're going for, bear in mind that you can see what the other players have discarded. There are 34 different tiles across the three suits, as well as winds and dragons. Each tile has four of it, meaning you can make a rough estimation as to how many of a certain one remains, which may help you choose what hand you're aiming to make. There are a few other game options, but they all revolve around the core Riichi rule set. You can link up with three other Game Boys if you wish. Based on my limited familiarity with the actual game, this feels pretty realistic. Any failing I have is down to me not being that well versed in the game's intricacies. Jantaku Boy is a good go-to if you're looking for a genuine Mahjong experience.
Inspired by the successes of his seminal work Master Karataka, Jordan Mechner returned to video game design in 1989 with the birth of a much more impactful franchise. Originally released on the Apple II, then ported to virtually everything it could run on, Prince of Persia could be seen as groundbreaking in several ways. Certainly, it was one of the earliest attempts at a simulation of motion capture in a video game. It wasn't strictly speaking true motion capture, which wouldn't appear until the early 90s with games like Virtua Fighter. Gone was the staccato simulacrum of human movement we saw with Karataka. Sprite animation was modelled in a radical new way, and it showed. The characters' actions were smooth as silk in a way that, in 1989, had not been seen before. Storyline-wise, nothing radical here, but that wasn't the point, and credit can at least be given for transposing this story to a somewhat untrodden time period placed, loosely at least, in our own human history. For sure, famous franchises such as Tomb Raider and Assassin's Creed take a ton of inspiration from the atmosphere created in Prince of Persia. Set in medieval Persia, now Iran, you control an unnamed protagonist, tasked with venturing through a series of dungeons to defeat the evil Grand Vizier Jafar, who, in the Sultan's absence, rules with an iron fist of tyranny. One obstacle remains between Jafar and the throne, the Sultan's beautiful young daughter, who has been imprisoned somewhere in the dungeons as well. You'll initially see a cutscene showing the imprisoned princess being accosted by Jafar himself. She bats off his approaches, causing him to place an hourglass in front of her. Marry Jafar, or die within the hour, he opines. And that's exactly what the game is about. You are the brave youth she loves, equally imprisoned in Jafar's labyrinth, and you have precisely 60 minutes to find her. It's a save the princess storyline, but this time it feels a lot more motivated. The reason more crucial than some ham-fisted love story, the sense of urgency more definite as that clock ticks ever down. The first thing that strikes you is just how gosh darn good this game looks. Every conceivable movement is beautifully rotoscoped, from jumping and running to climbing up platforms and sword fights. The attention to detail was not only bestowed on the character, but also the setting and backgrounds. Flames, spikes, and so on are all superbly animated. It's a black background game, however, so it can be a little tricky to view on the dot matrix GBs. Play it on anything Game Boy Color or later, and it looks gorgeous, and as smooth as any home computer version out there. You get three hit points to start with. This can be extended by drinking enough of these potions that you'll find around the place. The level layouts are varied and non-linear. You'll often have to find floor switches that open gates somewhere else, navigating in all four cardinal directions around this temple maze with plenty of backtracking. There are death traps all over the shop, whether retractable spikes or inescapable pitfalls. And you'll die a lot, believe me. It's one of those games where you have to learn the layouts and the routes. So often will a piece of the floor disappear, causing you to plummet to your death. There are no real indicators which part of the floor are unstable. The animation may be buttery smooth, but at times this is at the expense of the player inputs. The controls do feel very stiff and not entirely intuitive. For instance, you jump directly upwards by pushing up, but jump forwards by pressing A. I feel that pressing A plus a direction would have felt more natural, but maybe I'm looking back at it too retrospectively. Early on, you'll find a sword which you'll need to use to kill certain guards. At first, these are human, and relatively easy to beat once you get the weird timing right. Later on, there are ghost guards who you can't damage directly, but instead have to force backwards off of platforms to kill. The sound is not as polished as the graphics, but then that's the case in basically every iteration of this game. It's uninspiring to say the least, and a little abrasive at times. There is little music. Instead, your footsteps, crashes, sword strikes all have their own little sound effects, with tunage reserved for short jingles when you smite an enemy or find level transitions. That brings me to a saving grace that helps quell the difficulty. If you find a stairwell, you'll be given a password that'll allow you to start again from that point should you die. I'm very conflicted about Prince of Persia, possibly more so than any other game in this chronology so far. For an early adventure title, this is not a flawless piece. The controls are tricky to get down, being as sluggish as they are. 
Having said that, I have a ton of admiration for all involved, for managing to get Prince of Persia on the Game Boy and being able to keep it this consistent. Like I say, it looks phenomenal for the time and it gets a lot of credit for that. But for some reason, probably the controls more than anything, once you look past that delectable veneer, the game isn't really that fun to play. All the ingredients are there, but you never feel like you're getting your teeth into the meat of the matter. As with everything I've talked about, however, these remarks are not unique to this port. They apply to every version out there. The Game Boy iteration is faithful to what this game feels like regardless of how you play it. Frustrating, insanely difficult, cheap deaths are plenty. But at the same time, gorgeous, atmospheric, and most crucially, original. You never played a Game Boy game like this before 1992, I guarantee you. Another Japanese exclusive RPG now, but one that tweaks the formula in a few subtle ways. Storyline wise, not at all, a demonic force has arisen to take over the world and it's up to you to find the legendary fire jewel and seal the source of this evil. It seems that part of the reason behind the name Twin is to do with its main gimmick. The game uses something Athena called Double View Configuration, which basically uses the same character sprite to display the overworld from the traditional top view and the dungeon sequences from a side-on perspective, in the way that some early Zelda games do. It's a cool thing to look at for sure, and adds a platforming element to the proceedings. Is it strange to make such a big deal out of this? The box sure doesn't think so, stating, Being a twin makes me love games even more which doesn't really do anything for immersion, but there it is. The majority of the game takes place in these side-on dungeons and tunnels. There are 10 dungeons to work through. The graphics in these dungeons are surprisingly detailed and very effective, with purportedly around 100 enemies, each with their own sprites. 100 is probably an exaggeration, but it is nice to find a game that doesn't just recycle enemy images. I'm looking at you, Dragon Quest. As well as this, there are lots of different weapons and armor, as well as plenty of magic spells to learn. Perhaps tweaking the formula is not entirely accurate. More of the formula than usual more accurately represents what's going on here. Your character can be one of several classes. There are warriors, clerics, and mages, all who have their own skill sets. Oddly, you can't actually choose your class in a rather strange design choice it's assigned to you at random. A few tweaks have certainly been made to the usual leveling up slash money earning procedure you typically get at the start of these games. Wandering through the tunnels will present you with plenty of random encounters, a lot of which are incredibly difficult to get through at first. You'll die a lot in the first tunnel, but don't worry a great deal. If you perish, you simply lose half your money and end up back in the castle. Thing is, you don't directly earn money from winning battles. You need to return to the queen and tell her how many baddies you've slain. She'll then pay you. So, as long as you don't talk to her outside of the recovery screen, you won't have any money to lose. Bit weird, but that's how Athena chose to do it. Eventually, you'll win enough fights to level up a few, which then makes the combat a bit more realistic. You'll be able to afford weapons and armor upgrades given enough patience, then the adventure can properly unfold. In time, you'll meet other members who can be hired to fight alongside you if you have enough cash. Outside of the obvious window dressing and the handful of design tweaks, Twin is pretty standard RPG stuff. Most of the game takes place in these tunnels and dungeons, but there's a disappointing lack of variation in the scenery. Almost every screen in the game unfolds in front of a solid black background. The gameplay itself also suffers from a repetitive redundancy that stops your experience ever reaching the heights of something like a Final Fantasy or Zelda game would. Points for ambition with the presentation, even if it was done at the expense of much substance. Check out the box and label art if nothing else, it's really quite something.
I have to say, I'm slightly apprehensive about this. Ocean's record with movie tie-ins is not exactly stellar. The Addams Family was a very good film, actually a very good trilogy of films that had many a video game based on it to varying degrees of success. It also had this. I make the distinction because this is not a game. This is a test of your patience, as well as your bullshit-ometer. Let me walk you through my entire experience. You play as Gomez and have to rescue all your family members. The game starts. Two bats and a ghost immediately attack you before you can get your bearings. Upon contact damage occurring, you blink in a period of invulnerability, but you know what's great? When you're blinking, you can't attack. Was this the cruel, twisted intention, or one of the dumbest mistakes in all of video game history? You stand outside your mansion and can go inside or, if you like, scale the ledges and windows to get to the roof. There's a heart up there, but so many ghosts and bats that you'll lose more health trying to get it than you'll gain, so don't bother. Eventually, you need to go left or right. Ignore your platforming instincts and go left into the graveyard. You now need to get to the far end, while jumping over gravestones and throwing swords at various ghosts and bats. I'm assuming there are other enemies somewhere in the game. Well, you're probably better off just tanking it and running through them all. You'll lose a couple of hearts of health, but seeing as how the enemy's movement patterns are so random and hitboxes so incorrect, you'll no doubt take that damage if you try to fight them anyway. Get to the crypt at the end, and you'll have to fight a giant ghost who's keeping Wednesday hostage. You have to throw swords at his face while avoiding these little ghouls he chucks out at you. Touch these, and you crumble into a pile of dust. What's the point in a health meter if you die instantly with one touch? They'll eat your swords too, which is a problem because you don't have unlimited ammo. Once the gauge empties, no more swords for you. Oh, and there's no secondary attack like a fist or anything. That's it, you're attackless. You now have no choice other than to force a death, because you can't win the fight now. It takes at least half of that meter's worth of successful hits to the face to kill this thing. The other great feature of boss fights? They don't flash or make a noise when you hit them. No indication that you're doing the right thing whatsoever, so you have no idea if your attack is even working. Manage against all the odds to defeat the ghost, and Wednesday is rescued. She'll give you a golf club and tell you that she hopes you can swim. For what, I'm not sure. This golf club is the worst, and I mean the worst, weapon since the walking stick in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde for the NES. The art direction is… well, it's not so great. The scales are all wrong, the sprites look very amateur, and the hit detection really inaccurate. It seems these enemies radiate bad energy, as you'll take damage by merely being in proximity to them. You don't even need to come into contact with them. The level design is amongst the most repetitive I've ever seen, which wouldn't be so bad except virtually all the levels are just walking from left to right, or right to left to make a change, jumping over the odd thing. Enemies are placed right at the top of stairways, meaning you're getting hit no matter what you do. As soon as you leave and re-enter the area around an enemy spawn point, it'll respawn. No mercy. You have to complete the game in a certain order, but of course, there's no clues to be given as to what that order is. You may be tempted to enter the mansion first and foremost. Don't do that though, as eventually you'll come to this giant teddy bear that you cannot kill with your basic swords. You can damage it, but you don't carry enough to take it out completely. Eventually, you'll run out, even if you never miss it, and because you have no melee attack, that's your lot. Oh yeah, and once you die, you respawn right at the boss and can't leave, so you'll have to basically use up all your lives or just reset the game. This happens more than once, so expect to have to repeat sections of the game several times if you give a toss about completing this. I don't, it's just a shocking mess. The Adams clan are gluttons for misery, this we know. I think this might have been too much even for them, though. I mentioned the NES Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde earlier. The Adams Family for Game Boy is that bad. The controls are as bad, the weapons as useless, the enemies as impossible to beat. Hey, you know what? This might just be the equivalent game for the Game Boy. Someone get AVGN on the phone. Who, me? 
I'm the ghost with the most when it comes to domestic hygiene. Lydia's house has been infested by spooks and spirits. Who better to get rid of them than the ghost with the most? You start in the main hall and can make your way up the various staircases or into any of the rooms with the aim of taking out any otherworldly being that crops up. Beetlejuice does this by firing a magic spell at them. Looking at the main hub of the house from its side-on cross-section shows a ton of doors and stairways like something out of Hogwarts. Annoyingly, these stairs piss about with you as well, but rather than leading you to some creepy corridor on the third floor, the steps will turn into a slide in that good old Scooby-Doo fashion, which causes you to plummet back down, often skidding uncontrollably into the path of some ghost or monster. The stairwells on the main screen proved my first big difficulty. You can't walk up them, but have to jump, and at first it seemed so sporadic whether or not they would collapse. It frequently took me many attempts just to climb the stairs, until I realized you need to figure out which steps to jump on. Only some of them trigger the slide to appear. How are you supposed to know that when there's no telegraph to point out the trick ones? Those are the side-facing ones. The front-facing staircases are even more annoying, as what looks like rolls of loft insulation get lobbed down at you as you're climbing, leaving very little time or space to dodge. There is a pattern, but it feels just like the tacked-on difficulty that LJN loved getting their dev teams to include. The sort of sub-levels to the house take place in these rooms accessed by the many doors you come across. Here, each room of the house and the furniture therein has been invaded by one or two spectres, and Beetlejuice's job is to clear them out. The first door you come to is the laundry room, whereby various drying articles of clothing are possessed by a pair of ghosties, one who flies about and another who sort of jumps. You need to shoot down stockings, shirts, underpants, that sort of thing, until they're all destroyed, followed by the two ghosts themselves. Then, the master demon who was hiding in the washing machine comes out, and you'll have to take him down. Beat the room, and you return to the main hallway to climb up higher into the house. You'll then have to exorcise Engulied silverware in a similar manner. These multi-round fights are pretty cool, but were that the whole experience, it'd be somewhat dull. Fortunately, not all the rooms are like this. There's a rather humorous mini-game where you have to stop a randomly fluctuating face in as horribly contorted a manner as possible to get a grossness rating. There's no skill to it, you just press A to stop each facial feature. The higher your score, the more of an advantage you have in this one-on-one -on -one mini game against an owl where you have to fill a meter by pressing the correct direction shown on screen. There's also a pipe connecting game where you get 60 seconds to stop a goblin thing from flooding the bathroom. The end of the haunted house segment of the game features a rather clever part where you have to coax these two ghosts who are haunting the attic to their doom. The bedsheet-covered monster needs to be cajoled into various candles until he dies, and this thing that looks like a horse chestnut with legs needs to be encased in chests. This bit's good fun, if a little shonky, with the enemy movements not always going as you'd think. Sadly, this represents the high point of the game, and it's rapidly downhill from here. The next part is not too bad, you've just got to move these numbered statues around onto their plinths, nothing challenging or interesting really. After that though, prepare to hate the game. We were so close, LJN, but you couldn't resist putting in a horribly unfair death trap section, could you? You're in a minecart for a lot of it, other times riding bubbles or a snake pogo stick. Your health bar of 5 points is still there, but everything is now a one-hit kill, so there's really no point in it. And oh boy, there's a ton of stuff lying around to kill you. Your jumps and movements have to be nailed on perfect, else you die. What happens when you die? You go back, of course. What ensues is a 10 minute period demanding pixel perfect precision with every one of your inputs to get through. Trust me, 5 lives is not going to be enough. Some of the chat between Beetlejuice and Lydia are very odd in that way Michael Keaton made famous, just without the swears obviously, and it adds to the comedic nature of the game. Notorious as LJN are for making horrible 8-bit movie slash TV show tie-ins, their graphical accomplishments are often overlooked. That's totally fair though, if the game's horrible to play, who cares what it looks like? Still, Beetlejuice, like many of their Game Boy productions so far, looks rather good. Every pixel is dedicated to something or other, and the backgrounds are ever-changing. There's a couple of lovely little polishes, a mirror in the living room that actually shows your reflection as you move past it. Some parallax-ish scrolling of the moon with respect to the clifftops. All sorts of little visual treats if you stop to look. 
The music is a little odd for the theme, being a bit too up-tempo, but then I'm not overly familiar with the cartoon, and I imagine it was a little more kid-friendly. So, production-wise, Beetlejuice for Game Boy is respectable. Hell, it's actually fun in a lot of places. Could it be that teaming up with the guys who brought us Battletoads was a recipe for LJN to create a half-decent tie-in game? That's actually the perfect way to describe it. Half of it is decent, half bloody horrible. Oh well, that makes a change from being a complete failure. Set 11 years after the events of the original film, the young John Connor is somehow the key to civilization's survival against a robot uprising. The shape-shifting T-1000 sent by Skynet from the future to kill him in the past. So our old pal Arnie, the T-800, has also been sent back to protect him. The highest grossing film of 1991, as well as the most expensive movie ever made up to that point, was a pretty much universal success, and spawned a bunch of video games as you might expect. The Game Boy version has six levels, all with varying gameplay styles. The first level takes place on a war-torn wasteland. There's a lot happening on the screen, both in the foreground and the background. Each element of it looks great individually, from the sprite animations to the battles going on in the background, but I'm undecided as to whether it's all too much to take in at one time. Still, a great looking effort that was executed with barely any lag or flicker. This is one relentless game. Don't take your eyes off the screen for a second. Enemies constantly respawn from all sides, left, right, from the air. The assault does not stop. Honestly, I think your best bet is just to book it, shooting what you can. You won't destroy everything without taking a buttload of hits yourself, so maybe just focus on the task at hand and preserve some of that energy bar. It's not a left-to-right run-and-gun affair like, say, Operation C. You can move back and forth around the shooter levels. In fact, you often have to. On level 1, you have to destroy five control towers of varying height. You have to run back and forward across the level and destroy them in height order, tallest to lowest. Do it in the wrong order and you'll have to start over, but get it right and this machine comes out. This thing takes a lot of shots to kill, something like 20, and you can't hit its lower part. You'll have to jump, fire off two or three blasts into the head, then crouch to avoid its shots. The difficulty here comes not from the boss's firing patterns, it barely does anything, but from the input lag between crouching, coming out of the crouch, and jumping. It's almost as if you have to let the previous animation finish before it'll accept any further inputs. If your guy isn't fully out of his crouching position, the jump button ain't doing anything, and you'll probably get hit. Factor in that the constant carnage from enemies has not stopped either. Planes will still be dropping bombs on you, and grunts will still accost you from both sides. I'm exhausted already, and that's just the first stage. Although, tiredness will soon be put to bed, as it were, so don't fear. That health bar that felt so generous before? That's all you're getting, John. It doesn't refill ever, and you get one life, and no continues. How anyone is ever supposed to get to the end of this game, I have no idea. Just get good, I suppose. The second stage is a multi-layer affair, featuring more of a platforming emphasis. You have to find the correct door where T-800 model terminators are maintained, in order to hack one and use it to your own advantage. Here's where the game switches things up a bit. You're thrown into a screen of a circuit board, and your job is to, pipe dream style, move and rotate various parts of the grid to complete the circuits in the time limit. Unlike the health bar, this time limit is far from generous, sticking with the rock-hard difficulty pattern we've seen so far. Time runs out, it's game over. Get through a few of these puzzles, and you're onto yet another type of stage, an auto-scrolling motorbike scene where John Connor is racing through dangerous streets with a T-800 on his back, shooting at this truck that's chasing you. You're both controlling the bike without crashing into oil drums and Arnie's gun, shooting forwards and behind. Brutally tricky as ever. Terminator 2 Judgment Day was developed by British company Bits Studios. During production, they obviously consulted with the film company to make sure everything was up to scratch with the license holders. One of the points that constantly got referred back to them from the American production company was that Sarah Connor's bangs were too small in the game. 
Being British, the folks at BITS had no clue what bangs were. It's something to do with her hair, if you are wondering. So repeatedly made her boobs bigger instead, as you do. I wish I knew how many times they went back and forward before the translation was made for them. The results probably wouldn't be PG anymore. The music is pretty killer throughout. The intro theme especially has some of those divine low-end booms that you frequently got with these sorts of games. The sound effects don't override the driving, up-tempo music, but complement it. As usual with anything LJN had a hand in on the Game Boy, the presentation is properly impressive. Each stage is of a unique design. Aside from the overloaded first level, the graphics are spot on. As well as that, the gameplay switches up between levels in a seamless way that follows the plot of the film like few other tie-ins on the Game Boy did. Especially that last level, I won't spoil it for you, but wow. The downside for me is the difficulty, partly brought about by stiff controls, but mainly just the relentless nature of the stages. This level of challenge was obviously done to elongate what is quite a short game. Hey, it's not the only game of the era that did this, and it's not impossible. I know, I saw a video. A very cool little piece that might be one of the best movie tie-ins the system had. If you've never heard of this franchise, I'll let you off. According to our trusty friend Wikipedia, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes was a series of parody films that mocked cinema stalwarts like The Birds and Jaws. They were, intentionally or not, really flippin' dumb and about as successful as a low-budget parody movie usually is, leading to scathing reviews calling the original film a one-joke spoof and remarking on the toothlessness of its satire. I don't know if the website Rotten Tomatoes was named for this, but it wouldn't surprise me. Keep that word in mind when you play this game, parody, because what we have here is a parody of a video game, a virtually unplayable train wreck of a thing that, like a terrible parody movie, audiences surely must only have played ironically. First off, the controls are god-awful. Cardinal sin number one, the jump and attack buttons are the wrong way round. Call me a stick in the mud or whatever, but that's an immediate points deduction. Second, the start button is not pause, it fires a sub-weapon. No need to do that, stupid design choice. The start and select buttons aren't situated in a way that they can be used quickly. Have attack plus up or something. Stick to what works. I didn't even realise the swords I was collecting was a sub-weapon until I tried to pause the game and ended up throwing a sword into a tree. That's another thing, that's not how they work. You don't throw swords unless you're Legolas, and even then only in a pinch. This guy finds all these swords lying about the place and instead of thinking, oh I could use these to kill all these annoying little monsters that are walking around, no, he prefers to throw them away and carry on kicking the blighters. One dumb mechanic amongst many. Speaking of awkward button layouts, even worse is that SELECT is used to ride a skateboard. Invariably, you press SELECT with your left thumb, because that's where it is, but then how are you supposed to actually control your skateboard? You're walking about the countryside, city, pizza parlours, amongst other locales, trying to find an exit. The settings seem entirely random to me, but I'm not watching the film to see if they correlate. I'm just not birds rising up to take over the world I can just about tolerate. I draw the line at mutated fruit. There are all the standard platform tropes, crumbling floors, pitfalls, points to collect, that sort of thing. The titular tomatoes are all over the place, popping out of holes or falling from the sky, causing them to split into two smaller tomatoes. These you can collect for extra lives every 100. There are medallions and birthday presents scattered around as well, but I don't know what these do. The graphics and sound are remarkable only in that there is literally nothing to say about them. They do the job, nothing is hard to identify, and nothing is offensive to the ears, otherwise you're standard fare, adequate if nothing special. You won't even notice them anyway behind all the nonsense that the game itself presents you with. I'm trying to think if there's any aspect of the gameplay that isn't bonkers. 
So many mechanics leave you wondering how and why the developers arrived at that choice. It's not even a throw everything at the wall and see what sticks mentality. It's more of a, well, history shows us that this way works, so let's do the opposite. And okay, if the intention was indeed to create a parody of a game, that's kind of strange, especially on a console designed largely for a younger audience who certainly wouldn't get the joke. But if so, where's the fourth wall breaking comedy you'd find in other parodies like Scary Movie, Austin Powers or Spaceballs? If there's any horror comedy in this game, you're really gonna have to dig to find it. Attack of the Killer Tomatoes isn't even ironically entertaining. To be a great actress, you need two things, talent and luck. But even these aren't enough when someone puts a mountain in your path. Babs Bunny wants nothing greater than to make it big as an actor, but thwarting her dreams is the monster in this scenario, one Montana Max, who wants to knock down Acme Theatre to make way for a factory. Capitalism, eh? Undeterred, Babs is off to fulfil her destiny nonetheless. You play as Babs' friends and Acme University honor students Buster Bunny, Plucky Duck, and Hampton J. Pig, who decide to help her in her quest by watching her back. Immediately recognizable is the Tiny Toons music from the cartoon, and it's really well done. Hey, it's Konami, what did you expect? Throughout the game, the graphics and audio are entirely professional and faithful to the cartoon. Right from putting the cartridge in, you can expect a much improved standard from the last Looney Tunes game we had, that being Bugs Bunny Crazy Castle. What a difference it makes when you have a concrete production focus from start to finish, rather than slapping on a bunch of characters right at the end. A is jump, thank goodness, and B fires one of your character's weapons, of which you have limited, but can collect readily around each stage. Buster Bunny throws carrots, Plucky Duck has these pineapple looking things, and Hampton bowls watermelons along the ground. You'll start as Buster, and pressing B throws a carrot into the air in an unusual arc that'll take time to get used to. Honestly, I don't use them much on normal enemies, it's much easier to jump on their heads. You can readily switch between the three characters in the pause menu, the only difference being the sprite and the way they utilize their sub-weapon. The health and lives are all shared between characters. The physics are a little slippery, but you'll get used to them. There are boxes hovering in the air Super Mario style, but unlike Mario, you don't break them from beneath, you need to jump on top of them to reveal their contents. Similarly as well to classic Mario platformers, there are pipes that you can descend, well, tree trunks, which house mini underground levels with many points to collect in the form of diamonds. Collect 500 or more of these gems to reveal the true ending to the game, which I won't spoil here. Hidden in some of the pipes are bonus stages, where you can gamble some of your gems in a race against some other minor characters. You basically press A and B as fast as you can. If you win, you'll get your winnings and also a present, usually extra lives or some such. Sometimes you'll need to find other characters around the levels to help you progress. Find Dizzy underground on the first stage and he'll come dig a path for you that helps you pass a mountain that's blocking your way. Later on, you'll find Furball in the sewers, play a game of hide and seek with him, and he'll tell you where Babs has gone. It's lovely little elements like this that add to the mountain of charm this game has to offer. You'll eventually find your way to a moving train, where the audio and visuals are a real highlight. Going through a tunnel plunges you into a pseudo-darkness, pulled off very effectively considering the limited shading capabilities of the console. One of the bosses towards the end of this section is this massive flexing dog who darts back and forth. If he catches you, he curls you up into a basketball and hits a three-pointer with you. The animations are so full of that cartoonish Warner Brothers charm, they're thoroughly adorable and humorous, resulting in a fantastic title. And you don't need to be a fan of the TV show to enjoy it. This is one of those games you play with a smile on your face the entire time.
journey back to the Fortress of Fury with the second installment in the top-down run-and-gun miniseries. The first game in this series was the thoroughly excellent 1991 release Fortified Zone and came out worldwide. The third and final part of the trilogy is also pretty well known. Operation Logic Bomb came out on the Super Nintendo in 1993. However, the second game in the series is reasonably unheard of, seeing as it was released exclusively for the Game Boy in Japan. A curious decision that has made all the stranger based on the fact that it's probably the best out of the three. Fortified Zone saw you play as a pair of mercenaries who had to infiltrate a literal fortified zone, battling enemy soldiers, robots and turrets before eventually penetrating and destroying the core of the facility. I would definitely recommend going back and reading the review, and playing the game, if you've yet to do so, because it is up there with the best of 1991. Following their success in that mission, the protagonists Masato and Mizuki are back again, tasked with more of the same. Straight off the bat, let us address certain improvements that were made between the first and second games. Possibly the first thing you'll notice is, instead of movement being restricted to four cardinal directions, you can now move diagonally as well. Whereas before, the male character, Masato, could use a range of sub-weapons, these no longer exist. Instead, the standard weapon has been augmented to now offer a selection of three different weapons. One, a very fast auto-firing machine gun that you'll probably use the most, a slower but wider spreading shotgun, and also a grenade launcher. Both characters can use all three weapons now as well, it's simply a case of switching weapons using the select button. They all have infinite ammo and all come in handy depending on what is going on. For example, certain rooms are not accessible unless you blow a hole in the wall using the grenade launcher. Some enemies are much easier to hit using the spread shot, whereas some rooms are so replete with enemies that you'll want to go in there with just the standard machine gun, which fires at a very rapid rate. Another thing I noticed pretty early on is that the enemy AI seems to have been improved, in that they don't just traipse back and forward across a predetermined path. They actually will attempt to target you and attack. The original pair of characters are present in the game, each with their own health bar as before. The differences between the characters are more subtle here due to the lack of sub-weapons. Really, the only difference is the trade-off between health and maneuverability. It is certainly fair to say that you'll be playing as Masato most of the time, as his health bar is a lot bigger. Mizuki uses the A button to jump, which enables you to access areas that Masato cannot on his own. She also moves at a faster pace. Don't be surprised if you gravitate to the male character more though, as he's just more of a tank. Situated through the levels are these crates in which you might find health packs, or alternatively keys which you need to find in order to progress. Full clearing the maps isn't necessary as such, because you don't get any bonuses or anything like that, but you might miss out on health drops and so on. Fortified Zone boasted a very well put together soundtrack, and the sequel is no different. In fact, not only is the composition up to the same very high standard, featuring some signature motifs as well, but seems to actually be programmed more effectively, making the soundtrack even better than before. The sound effects when firing the weapons is as good as you'll get on the Game Boy, they have some real oomph to them. Graphically, the screen is used incredibly economically, the map is very easy to understand, which helps navigation throughout the levels immensely. Speaking of level layouts, a notable addition with Ikari 2 is that the levels are spread over more than one floor, which wasn't the case before. This really adds to the feeling of exploration. Be wary that there are several pitfalls that you can fall into, which will take you down to the floor below, and in fact this is something that you have to do at certain points in the game to access areas that you otherwise can't get to. If you want a more immersive experience featuring both protagonists at the same time, you can. With a link cable, you can actually play this game two-player, which I really hope to try at some point. I just don't know anyone who also has a copy of this game. When a team took an already excellent game and made almost every aspect of it that little bit greater, it creates some of the most pleasing work available. That this was a Japanese exclusive is a completely baffling and infuriating fact, as it's one of the best action shooters on the whole system. Phenomenal. King Barrius is once again trying to take over the world. Ray and three other adventurers set off on a journey to put a stop to his plans for conquest once and for all. 
we travel back to the land of Roland for another epic hack and slash adventure. If you remember one of the earliest RPGs on the system, from 1990, what we have here is pretty similar, even down to the story. Movement is still restricted to the four cardinal directions. You have your main weapon assigned to A, and each character has a sub-weapon assigned to B that is powered by the MP bar. That's right, I said characters. There are a total of eight playable characters to journey as now, seven of whom you'll meet as you make certain towns. Wander around the overworld and you'll soon see that the area frame layout made popular with the original Legend of Zelda is still utilised. There's something like 20 different enemy types mulling about in their various patterns. Killing them can sometimes drop small potions, which increase your HP back up a small amount, or grant you things that look like apples that increase your MP back to its maximum. Accessing the start menu allows you to view a rudimentary map, which is incredibly helpful for navigation, as sometimes the direction you're meant to be heading is not exactly instinctive. Contrary to how it seems, enemies don't automatically respawn. The developers tried to cut down on lag by only having a certain number of sprites on screen at any one time, so what's happening is some enemies will not spawn in until the other ones have been killed and their projectiles have vanished. While a reasonable idea, there's no telegraph where the new mobs will appear, causing them to drop directly on top of you, so you need to be alert. Thankfully, they won't immediately damage you. There is a grace period of a couple of seconds where they'll be flashing and don't interact with your character's hitbox, giving you time to get away. The enemy spawning rotation is not unlimited either, meaning you can clear screens, but if you leave a screen and return, they will come back, allowing you to grind reasonably effectively. However, grinding for potions isn't necessarily the most efficient, or even necessary way of regaining HP, as each town has a place called a House of Healing, which essentially replenishes all of your HP and MP free of charge. If you're caught out in the wilderness, then grinding is a solution, as long as you're careful not to move too quickly before you know an enemy's movement pattern. So, like I say, grinding isn't really needed. You don't gain experience points as such. Typically, leveling up is done by finding items in chests, which will then increase your HP and MP. A slightly unorthodox design choice, perhaps, but one that lets you make satisfyingly quick progress through the game. One of the problems of the previous game, not that there were many, is that you can't attack in a direction that you're not facing without first moving in that direction, which makes it tricky to hit something that's not directly in front of you without getting damaged. Unfortunately, this wasn't remedied here. Perhaps the devs didn't see it as a problem. It's just a nitpicky thing on my behalf, really. The physics would have benefited from a single frame of character rotation before the character moves so that you don't immediately put yourself in harm. There are ways around it though, you simply have to be more conservative with your inputs and don't be afraid to turn around and manoeuvre in a more indirect way. Having said that though, don't feel you need to be overly cautious with your gameplay because you have infinite lives. If you die on the battlefield, you'll simply respawn at the last house of healing that you used. At first, Ray's gonna have to go it alone, but get to the second town and you'll meet an elf called Pit who will join you, if you can help him clear the forest of all the monsters. Pit throws daggers as his primary attack. They are weaker than Ray's sword, but have a greater range, and can place a bomb somewhere on the landscape as his subweapon. There are seven people to find, they're pretty much always in towns, as you progress further into the game, all of whom have their own useful skills, strengths and weaknesses. This part of the game was very well thought out, and the characters enhance the narrative. Once you have more than one party member, you can switch between them. Depending on who and where they are, they will interact with NPCs and the environment differently. For instance, the original character is treated like a visitor in the second town, but Pit will be treated like a local. You can learn different things about the storyline based on who you have at the front of your party, which is quite an interesting mechanic. However, bear in mind that this is an action RPG rather than a turn-based affair, so you only have access to the skills of one of the characters at any one time. Learn the character's skill sets and where they'll come in useful. The music is very upbeat with a suitably folky composition and is well executed, and the small selection of sound effects, while standard, are appropriate and certainly don't grate on you. Is this game a graphical improvement over the previous game? If so, it's not by much. I will say that the screen is used very economically, with the health and MP bars taking up only a small portion of the lower part of the screen, leaving most of your view reserved for the actual in-game action. The tile-based graphics themselves are reminiscent of the Final Fantasy Legend games, if maybe not quite as polished as some of those, but the animations are charming. I would definitely recommend adding Roland's Curse 2 to your collection, were it not for one thing. 
Unfortunately, it's right up there on the higher end of the price scale. At time of writing, a loose cartridge is priced at more than £200, which is outrageous, let's be honest. It's one of those games that is astronomically more expensive now than it was when it came out. Usually when this happens, the cause is a balance between game quality and rarity. Rarity is one of those strange intangibles in any kind of collecting. Perhaps a better word in this case would be scarcity. Really good games might not be rare in the sense that there are lots of copies in existence, but they are scarce because they don't come up for sale very often. People hold on to them, and the more hyped something gets, the less likely collectors are to let them go. A good example is Castlevania 3 on the NES. This is certainly not a rare game, it sold really well, however, because of the game quality, people are loath to get rid of it. And when they do, they know they can charge more because people will pay it. Sometimes a game will be scarce because it barely sold any copies when it was out originally, whether because of marketing or because the game was terrible. I'm not sure what the case is with Roland's Curse 2. The game certainly isn't terrible. On the contrary, it's actually very good. Although in Game Boy collecting circles, it's still not a title that is talked about all that much. So whether the price point is a supply and demand issue, or that it's more artificially inflated, is certainly a question worth looking into. One for the emulator, I'm afraid. We're certainly learning about a lot of cool little niches of Japanese culture on this journey, and I'm all here for it. Tensai Bakabon is a pretty old manga series that dates back to 1967. It follows the misadventures of a dim-witted boy called Bakabon and his equally idiotic father. This video game tribute also came out on Famicom as a Japanese exclusive. Tensai Bakabon is the name of the little kid in the show. He works as a shoe shiner, but has a propensity for mischief. You don't actually play as him in this game, rather you're controlling the kid's dad, Bakabon no Papa. The controls are reasonably straightforward. Press A to jump, B and a direction to run. Pressing B while stationary opens and closes your umbrella, which can be used to slow your fall speed and get across wider gaps. If you come across a single space gap between two walls, you can sort of shimmy your way up between them. If you see blocks floating in the air, they'll quite often conceal food or drink. You don't hit them from below, but instead have to climb up onto them. If they drop a bowl of noodles, this will give you an extra cell on your health bar. If you get a bottle of milk, then this replenishes your health entirely. Papa's movement feels really stiff at first, but I think this is kind of the intention. It's a precise action to get the guy to run. Quite often he'll pull out his umbrella when you don't mean him to. Press your direction first, then B. Note as well the stopping distance, which is a fair way even if you've only dashed a short distance. Falling too far damages you, so don't go tearing off unless you need to, to make a jump, because you need plenty of landing space to slow you down, and you can't whip out your umbrella to slow you down quickly enough. You'll have to push up while jumping to get that little extra height so that he can grab onto a ledge. He'll squirm and struggle, so keep pressing up and the jump button to get him to drag himself up onto the platform. The stiffness and precision might frustrate you at first, but the idea here isn't to fly around gung-ho. Instead, think of it as a similar game to Flashback or Prince of Persia, whereby you need to learn what your character can do in certain situations, and use these movement rules to puzzle your way around the stages. Lots of intricacies will crop up as you play. You need to use the umbrella as a balance beam to get across a tightrope blocking falling objects with it, attacking enemies and bosses, that sort of thing. It's basically always implied what you have to do. The first level is set in a circus. You need to watch out for the crazed lions and escaped serpents here, as they drain your health super quick. Pretty soon you'll fight what looks like the ringmaster, and later on a spooky clown. Ugh. The boss fights, the ones I've got to at least, are not great. You automatically engage in combat mode, which sees Dad hold his umbrella like he's Guybrush Threepwood brandishing a cutlass. After the circus, you'll visit a ninja-styled level full of frogs. Not too hard, just master the movement techniques. Then after that, there's a gymnasium. I hit the wall here. At the end of stage 3, there's this jock-looking guy with a backwards baseball cap. You don't fight him, but instead have to beat him in a running race. Remember how mildly irritating it got when Dad kept pulling out his umbrella when you were trying to run? That little facet will become the bane of your existence should you get this far into the game. The race is essentially 
essentially a platform obstacle course where all your maneuvering skills come into play. It's hard and agonizing beyond belief. The animation is multi-layered and thoroughly charming throughout, with sound to match, but what lets this game down is the control system. Everything feels far too stiff and precise, and it can be incredibly difficult to pull off the moves you intend to. It's a shame really, because other than that, this was a very promising title. Unfortunately, the artificial difficulty imposed by the crap controls means you aren't going to want to play it for very long. Don't worry, there'll be plenty of other manga-inspired games, some of which might actually be good. In the words of Bakabon no Papa, Kore de no da! The first Oni game, Kininku Maruko Oni, was a delightful little standout in the RPG genre that, thankfully, was given the fan translation treatment. The other four Oni games, unfortunately, have yet to be that lucky, and so I am slightly concerned that I won't be able to do the games justice. I can but try. Takayamaru, the demon hunter protagonist from quite a few Oni titles, he's in 4 and 5 as well, is approached one morning by three of his neighbours, each reporting that bizarre monsters have taken control of their house and terrorised their families. They tell you whereabouts in town they live. To start the story, go visit them and solve their problems in a pseudo-tutorial kind of way, then progress as you'd expect. In fact, they don't let you out of town until you do. So far, so good. The buildings are obvious. Once you help one guy out, he'll become a healer where you can replenish your HP should you need. The shops all have pictures next to the items they sell, so the text isn't needed. That's not to say the text doesn't add anything, because the dialogue, and even the soliloquies, is quite charming and really helps to flesh out the adventure. Select will bring up a party chat screen that gives context and advice once you have companions. Before that, the game rather snarkily states, it doesn't matter what you say, who are you going to say it to? Which made me smirk. Once you've helped the townspeople, go north to find the monarch. It seems they're dying, or at least they're bedridden. They keep hearing a strange voice in their head. Before you know it, the monarch transforms into a great demon who proceeds to wipe out the guards, leaving you to fight it one on one. Or so it would seem. Enter an unnamed student ninja who smites the demon then leaves. You're soon summoned to a distant shrine where hopefully more answers can be found. Once out into the big wide world, there will be many random encounters to fight. My advice would be not to spend a massive amount of time grinding. Fight as many battles as you need to get the best weaponry and armor, but with over-leveling you're in danger of making the game a little too easy. The difficulty is balanced perfectly from start to finish, meaning you can spend more of your focus on the adventure yourself. And it's a good one. The story feels considered, with a few cool twists, and most crucially, it feels original. Obviously, there are always tropes that are touched on. Show me an RPG that doesn't do so. However, Oni 2 never belabors any point, moving the tale along swiftly. The backdrop to which it is told is truly gorgeous as well. The music is masterfully composed with a full regard to enhancing the atmosphere, and it's never cliched. Dungeons are accompanied by spooky, foreboding songs, and the overworld melodies are full of optimism and tribulations to come. The artwork, from the backgrounds to the character sprites, has a real attention to detail. The most important aspect, of course, is the gameplay. If you're a fan of RPGs and don't mind potentially missing out on some storyline nuances, trust me on this one. Oni 2 Inin Densetsu, much like its predecessor, is well worth your time. This looks every bit the arcade racing game. The artwork and even the intro graphics, even the text is racing themed. Start a level and the game even gives you a guided tour of the course you'll be competing on. But no, to my surprise this is actually a board game with racing elements. Before each stage you have the car configuration. Later on when you have earned car parts you can add them here, but at first these options are useless. So the track. I mentioned that you get a preview of the circuit. If you look closely, you can see that the track is actually made up of pretty large tiles. Every turn, you're given the choice between a movement or use of an item. You'll pick up items as you go around the track, and I'll explain these later. 
Otherwise, roll the die. Somewhat counterintuitively, you want as low a number as possible, which will let you move further. A six will move you one space. The lower the number, the farther you can potentially move, and also your car parts are considered. So say you roll a one. This will let you attempt to move to the front of the pack, but it's not quite that simple. Try to overtake someone to go into the passing minigame type thing. You'll get a top-down view of you and the nearby opponents. You have yet more options here. You can choose to ram an opponent, compete with them, dodge, or use an item. Ramming an opponent or trying to pass them seem to be based on a combination of both car's stats and luck. Sometimes you'll force an opponent to spin out, letting you overtake, but other times the same will happen to you. There's no real way to see what the outcome will be, but the strength of your own car seems to have an impact. Dodging will require you to time an evasive maneuver with an opponent's attack, which if done correctly will cause the attack to backfire, allowing you to slip ahead. As for the items, there are a ton of them that you'll collect as you race. There are DF effects, don't know what this does, I would assume something to do with downforce, jump parts, super grip, repair kits, hyper boosts, a lot of them do what you'd think, some of them are a little more nebulous. You keep rolling to progress around the track and you move to the next race should you do well enough, that's basically the whole affair. Graphically it looks pretty good and the music is well composed. The nerd in me really digs the 5-8 time signature for the racing scenes. Some better sound effects would have been beneficial however, I'm not overly keen on games that are so luck dependent and I'll be honest, I was kinda hoping for a racing game, but give this a chance. It's not a world beater by any stretch but I sort of ended up liking it. For the benefit of anyone under the age of 40, Asteroids is a classic shoot-em-up arcade game released way back in 1979 by Lyle Rains and Ed Logg, working for Atari. You control a multi-directional spaceship in a hazardous asteroid field, with the object of shooting and destroying the dangerous asteroids and occasional alien saucers, while not colliding with either. It was one of the first big hitters of the golden age of arcade games, selling over 70,000 cabinets and quickly being ported to virtually every Atari console during the 80s. When the Code Monkeys took on the task of porting it to the Game Boy in 1992, they were pretty savvy in their approach. Wisely, they didn't try to recreate the black background that you'd see in the arcade versions. Here, they stuck to an inverted colour palette, so the space is actually pure white, and the asteroids, spacecrafts, background stars and the like appear in the various shades of grey, 3 rather than 50, which is obviously much easier to see on the DMG. This allows the ship and the asteroids themselves to be cleverly animated with a raster effect, giving the minimalist look an impressive amount of depth. The controls are interesting and stem from this game's original design, which was that of an arcade stick shooter, whereby you move forward by pushing up on the D-pad and then steering left and right. You can rotate your ship throughout the full 360 degrees, which feels surprisingly intuitive when translated to the Game Boy. There were alternate ways it could have been done, but I think sticking to the arcade feel was the right choice. You fire the lasers using the B button and can use the A button to warp your ship if you need to make a quick escape from somewhere. Honestly though, I never really use this as it seems to put me in danger more often than it saves me. You start with three ships and every 10,000 points get awarded another one. Each wave increases in difficulty and later on enemy ships also appear on screen. These are not immune to the asteroids and frequently can be damaged by them. The Code Monkeys have a really good track record when porting these arcade classics to the Game Boy. You just need to look at Space Invaders, Missile Command, Centipede and more to see what I mean. They were an intriguing little company actually, not developing their own games very often but specialising in ports. They were responsible for the surprisingly successful Game Boy versions of Turrican and Road Rash, to name but two. They were, at the time of their closure in 2010, one of the longest surviving British game developers. There's not a whole lot else to say about Asteroids on the Game Boy. It's an incredibly faithful port that uses its host system perfectly. 
There's no real ending to the game as such, as was often the case back then, it's simply a case of surviving as long as you can. A few years down the line, it was actually released alongside another classic called Missile Command, and it's the exact same piece of code, so if you're not a completionist, I'd probably just go for that one. Following on from the success that was the self-published title of Parker Brothers' most famous property, we got a Game Boy release of one of their less renowned games, the quick-fire word puzzle for one to five players, Boggle. The rulebook for this one is nowhere near as thick as Monopoly is, but even so, you may not be as familiar with it, so I'll spell it out for you. Literally the worst wordplay in the whole book, but wordplay is the name of the game here. The physical game itself consists of a plastic cube tray with a 4x4 grid, into which 16 six-sided dice can slot into. These dice don't have numbers on, but letters. The tray has a plastic dome that sits over it, enabling a player to shake it up. The dice will then settle into the tray in a totally random way, and each player then has three minutes, as designated by a sand timer, to come up with words of at least three letters made with interconnecting letters. Words can be made horizontally, vertically, or diagonally, and can take any route around the grid, as long as all letters are touching sequentially and used only once. At the end of the three minutes, points are only awarded for a player if they have come up with a word spotted by nobody else. If more than one person finds a word, they're crossed off all players' lists and won't count. A unique three- or four-letter word gains you one point. 5 gives 2 points, 6 gives 3, 7 gives 5, and anything 8 letters or longer garners 11 points. You can play up to any score, really, depending on how much time or patience you have, accumulating the points as the rounds go on. That's the basic idea there, although there are several other game modes in Boggle Plus. Big Boggle actually exists on the market as it happens. This is a variant of the game with basically the same rule set, although the grid has been increased to 5x5 five five, and three letter words are no longer allowed. Anagram is a one or two player game, human only, where you get the same three minutes to decipher a mixed up collection of letters into an actual word. Categories is a kind of word search with various things related to a particular category, so it might say, find three items of clothing, and, well, that's the idea. Use All presents you with a 5x5 five five grid with letters that are eliminated as you make words. You still get three minutes and can re-roll the grid to generate new letters, with bigger bonuses given for more squares removed. These last three are really just bonus games. You'll be playing the 4x4 or 5x5 variants of the main game the most. These are the most entertaining to play as a single player. Like it was in Monopoly, you have a host of eight CPU players to play against, a top four and bottom four, and their respective skills seem well measured. Press A on a letter to highlight it, move to the next, and press it again. Press B to quickly rescind selected letters, and then when you've completed your word, press select to add it to your list. This being a timed game, it's obviously vital that the controls are as simple and unhampering as possible, and it's spot on. Pressing select both enters the word onto your list, and also returns the cursor to the first letter of the word you just entered. This helps out surprisingly often, as you can have plurals, past tense words, all that sort of thing. Find hate, for example, and you could also find hates, hated, hat, and so on. You'll want to be able to rattle them off as speedily as you can, and this simple little detail lets you do just that. When the time's up, the computer will tally up the scores automatically for you by scanning through its dictionary, which is purported to contain more than 35,000 words. As with previous word games Super Scrabble, the dictionary is finite and somewhat anachronistic, not to mention American English, so you again have the option to accept any words it doesn't recognise. Just be honest. Or don't, whatever, I'm not your mother. Oh no, it's another basketballing game, isn't it? So, as you know by now, I'm not a basketball fan. But I know who Michael Jordan is. He's the esteemed actor from Space Jam who was discovered on set by a basketball manager and given a lucrative side hustle in the NBA. 
And I also know who Big Bird is. His sports skills are well documented in the PS1 game Sesame Street Sports. The two guys on the intro screen do not look like either of these chaps. Maybe I'm being overly critical, but as we saw with some of the wrestling games, for example, it is possible to make a rough simulacrum of a famous person in pixelated form. These two are just generic basketballers. I'm appalled to the level of offended by the one song present in this game. Even if I wasn't a musician, I would know it's terrible. Although, heck, it's a sports game, music was never going to be that important of a factor. What upsets me more are the nothing short of horrendous sound effects. There isn't any in-game music to cover them up either, so you're left with a collection of very abrasive, poorly coded sound effects. No crowd noise or anything like that, just a horrible whistle which is very grating indeed. Horrendous is the worst word I can think of without swearing, but that doesn't come close to how bad the sound is in this game. It doesn't get much better with the actual gameplay. There are a handful of game choices on the start screen, but they all result in a virtually identical game, leaving you wondering why it was necessary to be lied to by an options menu. You play one-on-one -on -one against the computer. The opponent scores on you virtually every single time, regardless of where he is on the basketballing pitch. It doesn't matter where your character is positioned or what buttons you press, you will so rarely block his shots. I did it once by accident, and they nearly always go in. However, when you are in attack, there is no notion of any kind of aiming or skill on your part to reply. You can't learn how to be accurate, no finesse that you can employ at any point. Pressing A once when you have the ball causes your player to jump into the air as if gravity has been cancelled. Instinct, and every other basketball game I've ever played, would tell you to press A for a second time when you wanted to take a shot. However, this does nothing. You have to press B instead. Why this couldn't have just been the same button for both parts, I don't know. It's an unnecessary layer of programming that does nothing for the actual gameplay. With a mind on page space, I'm going to cut this review a little bit shorter than normal because I dislike this game so damn much that anything else I write will come off as vitriol. There is no appeal at all, even if you are a basketball fan, and it goes to show that in the 90s, Michael Jordan was more than happy to put his name to any old pile of wank if the money was right, and you know he got paid. Look at those publishers. Electronic Arts were no small fish in the world of sports games. There are plenty of other choices if you really want to play one. This is absolute toss. Loosely based on the 1990 Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman film of the same name, we have another attempt at a racing simulation game. I say loosely because the game really has nothing to do with the film except a common source material. There's no dramatic score by Hans Zimmer, nor any falling in love with a neurosurgeon. This is a straight up NASCAR racing game. Racing takes place from the point of view of the driver sat in his cockpit, and is a very solid attempt at a real time 3D simulation. We saw a very similar thing the year previous with Bill Elliott's NASCAR Fast Tracks, but this time it's much smoother and the controls are actually responsive this time. Quite an impressive accomplishment really. You have to feel these were infinitely trickier to produce than the more top-down arcade style racing games, especially due to the graphical limitations. Come into contact with the wall or other cars and your vehicle incurs damage, which eventually will affect the handling, meaning you do at least have to try to slow down. You can choose from a variety of different racetracks. Well, perhaps variety is not the correct word here, as although there are five tracks in the game, they are all virtually identical. But hey, that's NASCAR, baby. As well as a single race, you can also play through an entire season, whereby you have to qualify for each race, and then you accrue points based on your finishing position. A somewhat interesting aspect of the game, note I said interesting, not good, is that you perform your own pit stops, which entail you loading the car onto a jack, taking the old wheel off, putting a new one on, then repeating the opposite side. I can't think of another game that does this, and looking at it objectively, there's probably a good reason for that. It's hard to imagine why somebody would want to play as the pit crew. It's the equivalent of having to perform your own oil change during your car's service. I don't know who this part of the game is for, and it detracts from everything else. 
The music is pretty cool, and the car engine noises are about as effective as you're gonna get from a Game Boy. Not a bad effort at all, especially when you go too fast into a corner, the sound of your skid and inevitable collision with the side is really well done. Dreading another nasty movie tie-in, this game pleasantly took me by surprise. I wasn't expecting to be quite this impressed from a first-person racing game as the, pun intended, track record hasn't been great so far. I've docked it gameplay points for the dumb pit stop thing, but other than that, there's not a whole lot wrong with Days of Thunder. Kirk, Spock, Bones, and the original crew had the privilege of being the first to feature in a Game Boy Star Trek game, despite this coming out after the next generation had already existed for almost five years. The United Federation of Planets has learned of a monstrous planet killer, and promptly Federation engineers began working on a proto-matter fusion disruptor, the only device capable of stopping it. However, just as the Disruptor was being primed for use aboard the USS Excalibur, the Klingon Empire intercepted it, fearing it would be used on them. They demolished it into 12 separate pieces, hiding the bits on several different worlds. Now it's up to Kirk and his team to find the pieces, rebuild the weapon, and take down the planet killer. The game is split into two distinct types of level, one in space and the other on a planet's surface. Initially, you pilot the Enterprise and have to shoot at asteroids and various Klingon ships. Each space travel stage has a bar at the bottom of the screen that shows you how far you have left to survive. It also shows you how much of your shield remains. You press the A button to fire the ship's phasers and the B button to discharge a limited ammunition spread shot that pierces everything in front of it. Pressing start brings up a rudimentary control panel by which Kirk can apportion the ship's power across three vital areas, shields, speed, and phasers. Allocating more energy to one will diminish the others, and it's a case of finding the right balance. For example, putting a lot of energy into your weaponry makes them stronger and travel further, but increases the amount of damage you take and also slows you down. A nice idea. You get quite a few ships to play with, however, if you lose one, you go back to the beginning of that stage, which is a little annoying as A, space can get quite frantic towards the end with a lot of stuff happening, and B, the stages are long. And I mean really long. You might notice a twinkling of stars at some points. This is actually a warp gate, which if you pilot your ship into, you'll get warped forward a fair way. It's something like 10% of the distance. This makes a difference when each level is something like 10 minutes long, so keep an eye out for them. As well as this, occasionally a diamond will descend onto the screen, which will replenish your health a small amount. If you make it to your destination, you play as Kirk in a top-down level who beams down to a planet's surface with Spock and Bones. You don't get a choice of several characters like in the NES counterpart, and you don't work as a team either. You all split up in order to try to find parts of this weapon. As you're traversing the planet's surface, you can analyze various plants or rock formations, and the game will give you little tidbits of information about each one, kind of like in the TV show. Occasionally, you'll get tricorder messages from the other crew members, alerting you to nearby dangers or giving hints on where to go next, and you can also use it to help you navigate as well. It's very obvious what everything is, but I would not go as far to say that the graphics are overly impressive. Likewise, the music is identifiable, but not massively pleasant. Everything's just a little bit rough around the edges, you know? The stills are very cool, and the tricorder screen is immersive and feels like something from the TV show. Fair play to visual concepts, they've created a very long game here. However, the length isn't solely down to the amount of content. The space flight parts of the game are not that much fun. They go on far too long, and there's not enough variation. A death taking you back to the start is a nightmare. The ground levels are more entertaining, and this is where most of the gameplay is. Having said that, even these parts feel quite plodding at times. Hell, the final boss has something like five phases, all of which are very similar. At least the game tries to change things up, but overall, it doesn't really feel balanced enough. It's a strange feeling I have as I write this review. A game celebrating the 25th anniversary of something has just celebrated its own 30th anniversary. I'm not sure how I feel about that. Old, probably.
Master Higgins must journey to the South Pacific to rescue Princess Tina from the evil Witch Doctor. The original Adventure Island is an adaptation of the Sega arcade game Wonder Boy that originally came out on the Famicom in 1986 and the NES a year later. It's a well-executed, if underwhelming, run from left to right and save the princess standard platform fare that spawned several sequels. There are several monsters mooching around, they look like normal animals to be honest. You can't jump on them like you'd imagine, you have to either throw an axe or otherwise avoid them. It's a one-hit KO game, but you also have a constantly dwindling health bar that you must keep replenished by eating fruit or other foods that pop out. I guess Higgins needs his fructose or something. Maybe he's a diabetic. Occasionally, you'll come across these eggs that have stuff hidden in them. If you crack them open, sometimes a dinosaur buddy will pop out that you can ride. The dinosaur disappears at one hit as well, but can fire stars at enemies, which is pretty powerful. Just perhaps don't look too closely at where he's firing them from. Let's just say it's not his mouth. Sometimes hidden inside the eggs is a skateboard, complete with helmet and knee pads that you can use to improve your speed. It's a troublesome piece to ride, though. Sometimes there'll even be a fairy in one of the eggs, which gives you a short amount of invulnerability and speed up. If you collect an item from an egg that you currently already have, it gets saved, and you can choose to activate it at the start of a level. Certain Super Mario games did this with the Tanuki suits, Fire Flowers, and so on. Each world is split into four stages, the last of which will have a boss fight. The levels are basically all the same, you just run to the right and then enter a cave. Each level is also divided into checkpoints that you can return to should you die. In between levels, there is a mini-game where you choose from one of several rotating eggs. These can have various point scores or occasionally an extra life in them, but it's pure luck, there's no telling what you're gonna get in there. The game's design is consistent with Hudson's usual charming cartoonishness, and the music is suitably high-spirited and chirpy. But like the rest of this game, it all suffers with a quickly developing tedium brought about by a complete lack of any variation. The level design is the worst culprit for this. Occasionally, you climb up platforms, but for the most part, you're just moving from left to right. This occurs over the entirety of the game. The challenge isn't particularly high either, with no real difficulty curve to speak of. Each island ends in a boss, and these are a particular highlight of the game if for no other reason than it breaks up the monotony. I don't know, Adventure Island is something of a favourite of a lot of retro game fans, and I can kind of see the appeal. The series comes with a certain prestige attached to it. Whether a lot of that is nostalgia doesn't really matter, I suppose. I just find it too samey throughout, from pretty much any aspect you choose to look at it from, which leaves me kind of bored after about 10 minutes. You're constantly waiting for it to start, and it never really does. Adventure Island had several sequels on home consoles. This was the first of two games on the Game Boy. Let's hope the second one is a little bit more progressive. Back to the world of Dragon Slayer, let's hope that this action RPG is better than that godforsaken mess that was 1990's Dragon Slayer 1. First off, you'll have to equip yourself. You get a thousand gold with which you can buy a basic sword, armour and shield. Or you can skulk around the castle to the right to find the best armour and shield available to you at present, meaning you can spend all your cash on the much stronger longsword from the armour. I'm not advocating stealing from your country's monarch, but then you'll need to equip it. Nowadays, you might be used to the luxury of shop vendors dressing your characters in their latest purchases, but customer service wasn't up to the same standard back then. Press B to access the menu, then it's the third option down. Top option is magic, then it's items. The fourth is your save game. You don't earn money the usual way, you can only get it by selling things that enemies drop. And if you've just bought the longsword, you now need to find an extra 200 gold in order to buy that health spell. Near your home village, you can heal at any time by talking to the old man in your house. But out in the world, healing opportunities are few and far between. The way you level up is a little weird as well. On the bottom right of your screen is a little gravestone with a number next to it. This is a kill count. Once you slay a hundred monsters, you'll level up. This is remarkably easy to do. At various locations in the overworld, you'll see something that looks like a cemetery. This is a monster spawn point, and they'll keep coming indefinitely. So just camp out there and stab stuff until you level up as much as you want. If you ever get stuck in the game, just come back to a spawn point, rinse and repeat. 
It's super cheap, but the combat is not really this game's strength, so you might as well get it out of the way in one go, and then avoid the majority of the enemies thereafter. Well, I say you level up, but there seems to be two concurrent experience meters in this game. I've never seen a leveling up system like this. Killing 100 enemies increases your health and MP, which you'd think equates to leveling up, but looking on your stat screen, it still says level 1. Your attack and defense points don't actually increase when you do this, you're just tankier. The way to properly increase your character strength is to beat a dungeon boss. Each one will increase your level and give an even larger boost to your HP and MP. The way the game progresses is fairly standard. You go from town to town, doing favors like killing bosses or fetching stuff. Although occasionally these mini-quests can be a little cryptic. For example, the first town you come to is being plagued by a goblin. You need to go to the entrance to his dungeon, only to find you can't get in because of a great swamp. The guy stood there tells you to find a woman who might help you, and to take this water turtle. So you have to go look for her, she stood not far away in front of a waterfall, and she tells you to fill the turtle with water from this spring, at least the word translates as turtle, it might have a second meaning that makes more sense, I don't know. Take that water back to the swamp and pour it in, which somehow dries up the swamp, allowing you access. There are a bunch of instances like that where you go to a place, get an item, and backtrack a ways to use it somewhere you were previously. Often, there are few clues as to what you need to do, which can be irritating. The dungeons are not very exciting. They're virtually always a linear path populated by the same enemies you fought outside until you get to a boss. The bosses typically have one, two at most, attack patterns, and if you can find the safe spot, you'll beat them without a problem. I found the whole game to be like that. Dragon Slayer Gaiden is alarmingly devoid of challenge, and it's not down to me cheesing the leveling up system. It's better than Dragon Slayer 1, which was awful, and considerably so. And if you're after a really breezy, casual, brainless action RPG adventure, then this might be just what you're looking for. The sequel to 1991's The Adventure of Star Saver was a title I held quite a high anticipation for. The original Rubble Saver game was a blast, a varied, intriguing platformer that had this really interesting grapple hook mechanic that rescued you should you fall down a pit or something. It was tough, with the ghosts and goblins, two strikes and you're out style of gameplay, but compelling with delightful music, ambitious level layouts and artistry, and damn tricky boss fights. Sadly, all of that was kind of lost with the follow-up. It seems like our hero has made some improvements to his mech suit. Your lifespan of sorts has now been upgraded. You can take two hits rather than just the one. Starting in your two-legged mech suit, getting hit for the first time knocks the top half off. A second hit by a projectile or contact with an enemy knocks the bottom half off, leaving you an unarmored man. If you die, you're forced back quite a way. Even dying on the boss fights takes you back halfway through the level, rather than just to the start of the boss fight. The grapple hook has been somewhat improved as well. It's no longer used to rescue you should you fall, as you're now equipped with a limited supply of jetpack fuel. While you can't fly around the levels with it, it'll activate should you plummet, and gives you something like 5 seconds of flight, enabling you to get back on solid ground. No, now your hook looks more like a plunger that you can at any time fire vertically above you to connect to platforms. This forms the biggest part of your platforming as certain jumps are not actually achievable. You'll have to launch yourself as best you can, then fire the plunger up at just the right time to cling onto a platform. Like Bionic Commando, you can flip up onto some thinner levels, but unlike the title that made the grappling hook mechanic its own, you have next to no maneuverability here when on the rope. You can't swing left to right or extend it up and down, which sucks. You're just stationary. Pressing up will take you on top of the platform if you're able. Down will simply drop you. You can sort of squirm your way along by quickly detaching and re-firing the rope at the same time as nudging the D-pad along. It's far from graceful and about as unnatural a movement as you could imagine. The whole rope mechanic was not thought out properly at all. The level variation is a letdown too. There are seven levels to choose from. You can pick from the first three, but then when those are all beaten, the final four levels have to be beaten in order. 
whereas the world she traversed previously had a real widespread design and told a nice story. Here, the levels are unremarkable from each other, with barely a background, the same handful of enemies and layouts that always seem to repeat. So often does the game give you the feeling you've been here before, with the second half of some stages being virtually identical to the first. Remember as well how The Adventure of Star Saver wasn't just your traditional left-to-right affair, but went up and down and back on itself? Yeah, this one doesn't. Apart from level 3, which is actually a series of small rooms, the only real change from the formula all game, you can't go backwards once the screen scrolls. Sure, Super Mario Land and Mickey's Dangerous Chase did this as well, but they were great platformers with a pace that encouraged the player to progress. This one isn't. Your weaponry is improved a little. The normal fire is here, but can now be augmented with a 45 degree upward shot that's very useful for hitting things on platforms above you. It's also great for some bosses. There's also a kind of laser shot that doesn't dissipate when it hits something and can also travel through walls. Let's talk about the enemies for a second. They pretty much all die with one hit, which is kind of lame. If you edge along slowly enough, you'll never be posed a problem by them. The bosses, while looking pretty great, don't really improve things either, as their patterns are kind of mindless and only mildly interesting. Nothing in this game will take long to puzzle out. Just take a listen to it as well. The music really doesn't fit at all. It's too dreary. A 20 second loop that feels like it should accompany some third rate Tetris knockoff, and it doesn't change much. The boss fights sound so discordant, so grating, and the sound effects themselves seem as though they were mixed up. The jump and fire noises sound like a coin collecting jingle rather than a bounce or shot. It's quite odd, and marks yet another example of where this game fails in comparison to its older brother. Comparing Max to its predecessor leaves a slightly sour feeling. Maybe I'm being a bit harsh by doing that, but with games in a series, it's kind of necessary. Castlevania Legends doesn't seem that bad until you compare it to Belmont's Revenge, so I think it's an important distinction. Coming from what was a nicely varied game with aspiring graphics, a really fitting soundtrack and quite clever level design, what we're left with is a lacklustre, rushed sequel with all semblances of creativity sucked out of it. What's strange is, unless you were Japanese, you wouldn't even know it was a sequel until you played it. Maybe not even then. Similar to how Fortified Zone had a little-known Japanese-exclusive sequel, the more astute of you will realise that Tenjin Kaizen 2 Yomihon Yumigo Yomi is a follow-up to Meldak's 1990 side-scroller Mercenary Force. Yeah, I had no idea either. One of my happiest discoveries during my Game Boy Library deep dive was finding out that Ikare no Yusai 2, a sequel to one of my favourite run and gunners, existed, and more to the point that it was actually even better. Let's hope that Tenjin Kaizen 2 can follow suit. Straight away you're immersed in the game with one of the most cinematic intro sequences the console had. Fantastic anime-esque moody backgrounds and a pensive score really help to set the scene, and you feel more as though you're about to play an epic RPG than some side-scrolling shoot-em-up. Indeed, not long into it, you see a classroom with a bunch of students reading from books, then some massively cranial person appears at the back. Or at least the teacher can see him. The kids think he's losing his mind. The intruder swiftly disappears as to prove them correct. You then get options to talk to people on the screen or examine things, kind of like a point-and-click adventure game. I was not expecting that. Indeed, that's exactly what this is. It's more of a visual novel than a game. Sequel in storyline, but not in gameplay. You follow the story of the teacher, helping him investigate this weird occurrence in his school that only he can see. He gets more and more dishevelled as time goes along. Each scene is often split into sections, which you can look at or interact with. 
The text at the bottom of the screen tells you what button to press to do which action. You can't really go wrong, the point is to interact in every way you can in order to move the story along. And a fascinating story it is, too. Mercenary Force isn't a game I knew we needed such context to, but there it is. I'm not going to write any more about the storyline, you really need to experience it for yourself. Suffice it to say, this is nothing like finding the sequel to Fortified Zone. Mercenary Force 2 is about as removed from the original as it's possible to be. This is such a unique entity, and had I not resolved to looking at literally every release in the library, it would have remained virtually undiscovered, at least in my knowledge scope. There seems to be not a drop of information in the English language part of the internet. Far too much text to be fan translated, I guess. Hey, if nothing else, this will help you learn your hiragana comprehension if you didn't want to study with Doraemon or Maruko-chan. Play a game of 2 on 2 basketball on half a court. You get three passes between your pair, after which you have to shoot or the ball gets turned over. You start from the back line and your teammate is further down court, probably being ruthlessly marked by one of the enemy. I wouldn't be so visceral in a sports game usually, but they really are referred to as your enemy. Press A to pass and B to shoot. The shooting system is a little hard to get down. You press B once to start your jump and then B again to start the throw. Not too unusual except for how fast it happens. Then you have to somehow press B again when the aiming gauge is in the right place, except again this occurs so quickly that I don't know how you're supposed to ever do this skillfully. The screen just pops up and a split second later it's too late. The only way I've managed to get it to work is to remember roughly how long to leave between the button presses. You need to fit all three B presses in evenly in a time frame of roughly a second. That way you might have a chance, otherwise you'll either miss or be called for travelling. It's a shame, because the rest of the controls work quite well. Passing is easy and accurate, it being simple enough to find your teammate. Interceptions work by you moving in front of your opponent, there's no button to press, and the same applies when trying to block shots. You just have to be in the right place. The game moves at a reasonable pace, except for the shooting, and some of the animations when hitting successful shots are decent. There's only one game mode as such, but there are two variants of it. In Type A, you control both players on your team. On Type B, the CPU will play alongside you. Other than that, there's very little variation in the game. Super Street Basketball is an okay, if slim, title, adrift in a sea of mostly horrible basketball titles. I don't know why this sport was so hard to get right in the early days of video gaming, but there it is. Captain Tsubasa is one of the best-selling manga series of all time in Japan, as well as having a massively successful TV series, and apparently worked wonders in introducing Japan to association football in the 1980s. Whereas people in England look to the Beckhams and Ronaldos of the past generations for inspiration, many actual professional soccer players in and even outside of Japan were originally inspired by Tsubasa Uzura and his football-themed series. Indeed, there have been many games based on the series, some better than others as we'll see later, with the franchise still active to this day. It would have been all too easy to simply cut and paste Tsubasa into a generic soccer game and have done with it, reaping the income that surely would have come regardless of how good the game was. In fact, this does not try to present realism, a sports simulation or anything of that nature. Wisely, it sticks to what made the manga series a compelling one. It's about the story as well, Tsubasa's story, the trials and struggles he has to overcome to get to the top. Instead of tapping the A and B buttons to pass, tackle or shoot, the game progresses as a series of skill and stat-based decisions. When it comes to taking an action, a menu will pop up from which you need to pick an option as to what you're going to do. If you're in possession, these will crop up whenever you need to shoot or whenever an opponent comes to tackle you. If you're chasing the ball, you can choose to perform an action by pressing B. There are plenty of strategies you can employ outside of the normal realms of football simulation. Fans of the manga will no doubt remember the crazy, gravity-defying flips and unbelievable passing combinations Tsubasa and his team could perform, and that's all here. The best players from each team in the show have combined to form a super-strength Japan team, and you're off to what I assume is the World Cup. 
The animations are a real standout, with very little lag to speak of, but the rest of the graphics are sharp and highly effective. The collection of songs that comprise the soundtrack are very well done and instantly recognizable from the show. On the strategy theme, each team has their star players, their strongest units, if you will, for whom the skills are easier to use. More impressively is this mechanic called Guts, which is basically like experience points. Depending on the outcomes of the matches, you can level up your players by allocating stat points, which help you progress through the tournament. This might seem like a lot to take in if all you're after is a football game, but like I say, this isn't really that. It's a football-themed RPG with sports gameplay mechanics in it. An oddball of a title, but certainly one that the developers can be proud of, as it definitely stands out from the crowd. The school's big game is being held at the base of Mount Fuji. Our friend, the hapless Maruko-chan, is supposed to be helping out, making sandwiches for everyone, but she slept in. She just makes the bus in time, and as it rolls up to the school, Maruko remarks how lucky she was not to be late. Sounds like you are, senorita, remarks the creepy boy sat across from her. Hanawa-kun loves to use Spanish slang in his pathetic attempts to pick up our heroine. Previous games in this franchise have been largely story-driven, with mini-games thrown in every now and then. Similarly to the first two, I don't really use this as a game, but more of a language learning tool. Outside of that, there's not a ton to get out of it, in all honesty. There are, I think, ten mini-games, ranging from claw machines to memory games, strength and frisbee. There's a whack-a-mole game and a karaoke challenge. Many of them are an exercise in pressing A or B a lot. Probably the most interesting one is this marble game, where you have to roll a marble along a precarious course to get to the end. It doesn't really achieve anything should you win or lose, though. Nothing really to sustain you here. At least there's no rock, paper, scissors this time. Directed at children they may be, but that's the level I read at. I find the Chibi Maruko-chan games particularly useful because they mix hiragana with the more elusive katakana, the writing system primarily used for interpreting foreign, i.e. not Japanese, words, and so you don't see it nearly as often outside of textbooks. Also, I find Maruko to be hilarious and adorable, and I'm always glad to go on an adventure with her, no matter how innocuous it might be. Color me excited, a Wacky Races racing game. This should be good, right? I'm slightly suspicious that this only came out in Japan, but it was made by Atlas, so at least that's promising. I absolutely loved this cartoon as a kid, but it's been a long time since I've seen it, so I'm really hoping that this game doesn't tarnish my nostalgia of it. At first glance, this is promising, as there are the traditional ten races to choose from. The Japanese translations of the names are on point as usual. Penelope Pitstop is called Fussy Cat, the Ant Hill Mob are named Gang 7, and Peter Perfect is delightfully just called Handsome 9. You can't play as Dick Dastardly, but as I remember, he was never actually an official participant in any of the races. He just sort of turned up and tried to screw with everybody. That's pretty much what he does here, too. There's no need to qualify for any of these races. You simply press A to stop Muttley's rotating sign, which decides what position the you start at, then it's straight into the race. So to the starting grid, I'm the Slag Brothers because they crack me up. Let's go! Uh, wait, what? Something must be wrong here, I'm pressing A, B, I'm not moving. I see the Bouldermobile in some cutscene, Red Max drives by in his car plane thing, and I'm getting smashed up. It was a cool animation, but I feel pretty cheated right now. Okay, back to it. I still can't move? Well, what am I doing wrong? It's not start. The up direction shifts my car a little to the right. Still no forward momentum, though. Oh, great. Lazy Luke and his stupid bear friend are now chopping at my car with axes. Okay, so I just can't move at all? Oh, I think I see. I pressed left because I'm trying to head left on the screen. It's almost as if this game isn't actually a racing game. You're literally just moving with the arrow keys, and it's a very stop-start process that looks as if you're moving grid-like around a snakes and ladders board. 
their arrows pointing in various seemingly random directions, and nobody seems to follow them. They just go wherever they please, Carmageddon style. I think you're looking for an exit or a finish line, but there's no real indication where this is. All the vehicles seem to travel at exactly the same speed all the time, meaning there's no way to actually catch up to any of your competitors, never mind overtake them. You can see something that I'm guessing is a map with the rough locations of the other cars, however they're not actually shown on a map of the track as such, they're just pixels floating in a black void. Is there even a track anyway? Apart from the starting grid, position doesn't even seem to matter as it's not tracked anywhere, and there are no lap counters or anything like that to speak of. In fact, it's as if you're racing point to point in the countryside, which, come to think of it, rings a bell with the cartoon, as they weren't usually on racetracks, if I remember correctly. I'm not sure how I managed it after taking a while to even move, then getting annihilated every 10 seconds by one of my opponents, but somehow I actually finished 6th in the first race. How this happened, I have no clue, because I don't think I overtook or damaged anyone. How absolutely bizarre this title is. I mean, it looks cool in that it's very recognisable as Wacky Races. All of the characters are faithful to the cartoon. I was really hopeful when I saw the character select screen, it was a very bright start. However, I have never before seen a game that falls apart so quickly and completely as soon as the actual gameplay starts. I was left completely dumbfounded and a little bit down about the fact that this is actually the only Wacky Races game we will get until 2000 on the Game Boy Color. Now that game is something to behold, but we'll have to wait until the sequel to this book to look at it. Sometimes I'm confused as to why a game never made it out of Japan. In this case, there is absolutely no confusion on my part. Well, that is until the game starts, at which point I have absolutely no idea what's going on.